Hey guys, welcome to Chief Pigskin's YouTube channel. You're about to watch a home clinic where we find one quality coach and he talks on one very specific subject. If you'd like to see more of these come your way, please like and subscribe below and check us out at clinic.chiefpigskin.com. Hey, I'm Daniel McDonald, head coach of Our Lady of Providence in Clarksville, Indiana. I'm here for Chief Pigskin with Rex Norris, the head of Adivis Football. Um, I've worked with Adivis personally. I found their tackling system to be excellent. Uh, we became better tacklers. We were more successful on defense. And um, Adivis works with several Division I college programs and several high school programs as well. Uh, Rex, great, great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. I'm excited, Coach. Thanks for having me. All right, Coach, I have to uh, drop a little marketing here. But once I'm done with that, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, we can get started. Okay. Uh, we want to give a shout out to Coach Jones and Impact Marketing Specialties. Uh, give Coach Jones a follow on Twitter and uh, you can receive 30% off for all coaches right now. That's everything from mugs, t-shirts, uh, memorabilia. Uh, Coach Jones is on Twitter at Coach Nate Jones. So go ahead and give him a follow and he'll get you hooked up with some gear. Rex, whenever you're ready, go ahead, buddy. All right. Well, we're here to talk about tackling. Um, you know, obviously we have a story to tell, so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, just kind of show and uh, what how how we're going to go about it today. You know, when we uh, when we tell our story, we got to have a, a little discussion about what it is that we know in level set. I said some of the biggest things that we've come up against is just people not talking about the same thing. They say the same things, but it doesn't mean the same thing. So I just want to create that. And then talk about how, how we can help maximize, uh, how, you, how you can help yourself maximize your practice time. And we'll talk a little bit about creating a universal language for you and your staff and your players. We'll talk about some progression-based drills to really improve the amount of time that you're spending. And then uh, talk about uh, having a plan, having a, a data approach to your plan. Um, try not to get in the weeds and just keep on going. Let's see if this thing will turn. Okay. So I apologize. I mean, let me. Uh, so this this is a video clip. I want to share it with you, and, and I and I don't know if it'll come across, but you know, when you're making a change like this, and when you're when you're applying something new, it's not easy. And you know, and, and and but I want you to know, there's coaches that have been coaching for a long time with a lot of success that are making changes just to get become better. And this clip this clip is uh, Coach Ash, who's now the defensive coordinator at Texas. Um, but it's him talking about making that change. And it's a real short clip. I just want to play it. And, Coach, if it doesn't come across very well, let me know. Okay? Gotcha. right now as a coach I could I could go show you our film and what we teach what we coach what we drill guess what it shows up on film not once not twice not by luck but by design just over and over and over and over and our players have bought into it and, and that alone in my opinion led to us having a lot of success especially late in the season we got off the field on third down why because we made tackles we didn't miss tackles we made those tackles and we got off the field so a lot of the, the things that we did good statistically goes back to what getting off blocks and tackling more so than what 
what we would have done schematically. I think that was now to have a coach like that come forward and 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 talk about the importance of the importance of, of rugby stuff or the importance of switching to this and what it meant for his program was a big deal and went way beyond schematics. It's about winning those one on one situations and that's what we're here to talk about. Not necessarily rugby style tackling. We're here to talk about how to tackle. Period. Whether it's in rugby or football or whatever the case may be. And, and this guy is in it to win, and, and, uh, and so it's just another validation point. Um, when it comes to what we're trying to provide, and, and I'm going to move on, I just want you to know we're, we're in this to help educate coaches and improve the performance of athletes and then, and then ultimately improve the safety of our athletes so we can improve this game. And, and so everything you're about to hear today is really driven by this. We're not going to talk about all of that. We're just going to talk about some ball, but I just wanted to give you some understanding of where out of this is and what we're trying to do. Uh, this, this next clip is some examples of some programs that we've worked with over the last few years. It, and it shows you where they were statistically. And so a lot of teams, a lot of people will think that we only work with high-end programs or, you know, it only, it's only working for, you know, teams of a certain style. And here you're seeing teams that were very low performing as, very, as well as very high performing before we even started working with them. And in that first year, in that, in that middle column, you can see where they moved to. And, and over the last two years, we've had the number one improved defense in the, in the country. Two years ago, it was Cincinnati, and last year it was Baylor. We're really proud of that. And, and there you can see where they had a drop off in the amount of points that they allowed. But the thing that we're really proud of is when we're working with programs, we actually track the amount of head contact they have going into tackles and into contact. And we had four first-time adopters last year with Baylor, SMU, Oklahoma, and Texas Tech. And we saw a downward trend throughout the, throughout the season. And, and at the end of the day, it is about performance, but it's also about safety. And, and uh, the players bought in and the coaches bought in. And this is just another, another example of how that works. And in the state of Texas, obviously, uh, for those people that don't know, we're actually uh, a mandated curriculum for coaches. And, and, and the association itself has really seen this as a big positive to be able to go back to your parents and be able to go back to your communities and tell them what you're trying to do proactively to get out in front of this and to, and to have a better experience for your athletes. So we're really proud of that. Now let's get on to it. Uh, when it comes to, when it comes to uh, maximizing your time in practice, it really in, starts and ends with the way you talk about tackling. And one of the things we tell coaches is get your staff together, show them, show them about 10 clips and see how they all talk about that. If they're not talking about it the same way, if they don't see it the same way, then the problem starts there. You have to be on the same page with how you look at things. And that, that's really set up, the way we look at it is what we've done is we've taken tackling and we've broken it down into a two-part process. Well, what, what we mean by that is we have girls that specifically focus on pre-contact skills as well as drills that focus on contact skills themselves. And then we bring it together. Instead of just starting out, uh, trying to mash everything together. Um, what we have found is that you've increased player engagement and also player understanding and you get better skill retention. And the way that we go about doing that is we, have, we, have, we wanna have really simple goals. When it comes to contact itself, it really starts with that same foot, same shoulder into contact. Um, there's a lot that we can talk about with the technique, but uh, you know, I'm just going to I'm just going to give it a real simple level so we can go on to the drills. But we talk we, we start with same foot, same shoulder into contact, um, and then ultimately by doing that, by having same foot, same shoulder into contact, put all your center of gravity on the on the, on your strong shoulder, and if your head's across behind, it allows your your body to maximize power and control into the hit. It's fast to say that. I mean that you'll be able to keep your head from being a, going across the tackle, going across the tackle. But uh, if you can do this, if you can have better situational awareness, you're you're going to have more opportunity to make this happen. And the way that we go about in contact is we, we're really looking for controlled movement. You know that involves a lot of things, but we want to have control movement to be able to mimic the runner's movement all the way into contact, so we can anticipate when it's going to happen and make effective contact. And for us, that's body on body contact. If there's any misconception what we're talking about, we're talking about making body on body contact and be able to knock the runner backwards. 
We're not a tackling curriculum. We understand that rolling happens, but we, we see it as a poor outcome. And we want to make sure that, that we're helping the athletes understand what they need to do to be successful in contact. And that really starts with how we evaluate the tackle. And, you know, there's a lot of ways to look at this, and, and that's just important that you and your staff make this really clear to your athletes, especially if you're wanting them to understand what you want. If, if you have one coach saying great job and another coach is saying, I don't know, that, that wasn't that good, that's where the problem starts. And so what we've done is we've created a way to look at tackling. And, and we, we, we've shown this multiple times, but this is an example of how we look at tackling. And, and, and you can go into your huddle right now and start using some of these uh, some of these angles to start coding your tackles. But at the end of the day, all we really want is the, does the tackler understand when he's in a position to knock the runner backwards? And so we call those positive tackle situations. And when he's not in a position to knock those runners backwards, we call those negative tackle situations. And, and just understanding what they need to do be, to be successful in both is really important. So everything we do is really meant to help that tackler understand that when he has that opportunity, that he is going to be successful in knocking them backwards. And so we really focus on that positive tackle situation. Here's an example. Here's a video clip, and I know these are going to come out kind of choppy, so I'm going to run it with my with my with my uh, with my mouse. But here you have you have the the quarterback rolling out, and this is just a positive tackle situation. Watch as the defender comes up here. He's got the sideline there, but he's not going to panic. Watch as he comes into contact. He gets his feet right as he closes space. He gets his feet right. And right at the point of contact, he's able to go same foot, same shoulder into contact. Let's see if I can get it to work. There we go. And then he gets a punch on the legs and the play just ends. So when we're talking positive tackle situations, it's helping him understand what he needs to do to be successful uh, to be able to knock the runner backwards. This next clip here, and again, Coach, is that too choppy? It's coming through pretty choppy. Oh, man, that sucks. Okay. I'm going to try this one more time. Okay, as the linebacker reacts late, and it's going to be choppy just because I'm moving it with my mouth, but he's reacting late to this, to this crossing route. Okay, and so as he picks him up, he's no longer in a position. He's no longer in a position to knock him backwards. We call it right here. That's, that's a negative tackle situation. Can't even get it to stop. There it is. So all he's trying to do is to keep this runner from getting up the field. And so we want him to focus on his control and the contact. And he's able to do that by getting body on body and bringing him to the ground. So it's just about awareness. We're not trying to make, you know, to have a powerful hit in that situation. It's just to be effective. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. And then, and then, so what, as we're looking at this, you know, you might have two players that, that made nine out of 10 tackles, and that's the way most coaches look at it. That's a great day. But for us, when we're looking at it, we're, we're wanting the player to understand when he's making a dominant tackle, when he's made an effective tackle, but also when he's made a poor tackle. And, and then we apply the missed tackles, and we also track yards after contact. By doing this, by understanding this situation, you're going to be able to increase your effectiveness in contact. This next clip is, and I, if it's too choppy, Coach, I'll just go straight to the drills. But in this, this next clip, is this pretty choppy coming out? Uh, are you playing it now? Yeah. Yep. Uh, it's, it's skipping a few frames, but I think, I think we can understand what's going on here. So, so watch this clip as the, as the safety comes out of his run, out of his pass, out of his pass responsibility. Okay, it's a run through and he's got to make the play. He does a great job, actually. He actually, he actually uh, is able to stop the runner. But the way we look at it is once, we, once he starts reacting to the run, we want to know, is he closed in space? And in this case, he doesn't. He, he, can, he actually closes zero yards. And when he makes contact, even though he may, has an effective outcome, he stops him once he gets into contact. We want to know, how can he be better? And by understanding these situations, you're helping increase that situation awareness. When this, when this player is in the situation again, we want him to understand that he's in a positive tackle situation and that he should keep coming so he can initiate contact in a positive tackle situation. Because he didn't, he made contact in a negative tackle situation 
and wind up exposing himself to head head to head contact and, and yards after contact. All right. So when we're when we're talking about maximizing control, again, we, we said this, we talked about the, the two process, the two-step process. And it's not it's not brain surgery. I mean, these are the three things that we look at in the in, in contact itself, body position, the strike, and the finish. But for us, as we're going through this, it's really important that you emphasize each and that you have drills that are able to help the player understand what he needs to do to be able to execute both, but then also have drills that help them have the art of timing both. When it comes to pre-contact skills, we're talking about closing space, we're talking about leverage, but we're also talking about footwork. And it's probably one of the undercoached things that we, that we see coaches do is they're not necessarily talking about that footwork in the contact. And that goes back to that, that, that same foot, same shoulder. Here's an example of a, of a player, that same player in that same situation doing everything right. See if it'll go. That was kind of choppy. But watch as he reacts. Watch as, he, as we start to measure if he's closing space, watch him do it effectively this time. As he closes space in the contact, he now puts pressure on the runner to make a decision. And now he's in a position to where he can initiate contact and he's able to get body on body contact and knock the runner down. And again, it's about understanding that you're in a positive tackle situation and, uh, and that, that closing space is an important part of being able to do that, to be effective in that situation. And he does that. By putting pressure on the runner, he's able to make contact in a positive situation and be, and be in a position for an effective tackle. So everything we're doing in these drills is really meant to make that happen. And so now that I've gotten through that a little bit, I can show you how it is that, we, that we've taken drilling and, and maximized it, maximized time for coaching. You know, one of the worst things you can do is actually, and one of the worst things you can do is practice the same thing over and over again. And if it's the wrong thing, then now you have a lot of logged hours that could actually go against you and what you're trying to do. So when we're talking about tackling, we've actually broken this down into three types of tackles. We have the technical tackle, or technical drills that we've all done, right? And that this is now where you, you're telling them what to do, you're telling them how to do it and when to do it, and they should be doing it right 90 to 100% of the time. But some of the drills we're going to show you today are decision-making drills. And in those drills, you're looking, you're looking to work on the, the player's visual cues and his ability to recognize what's going on so he can execute his technique. But you don't want it to be 100% accurate. There needs to be some failure in there. Not to the point of where he doesn't believe in what you're doing. We want to still continue to build confidence, but we've got to have him learn so he can continue to improve his skill. So we're talking about sharpening the skill. And then the last set of drills that we're going to show you today are game-based drills. And, and in this one, it's really for the coaches to assess those types of drills and to make sure that he knows that what he needs to work on next. You can't treat every drill like it's a technical drill or you're going to, you're going to slow down the learning of the tackler. And so just to revisit the, the, the technical drill, it's the way you approach it, you, you approach it the same way every time, right? You have direct instruction, you tell them how you want them to do it, you make sure it's easy to see, you make sure it's repeatable, and you make sure that they're understanding how to be powerful and, and be safe in contact. Here's an example of a, of a technical drill. This is a strike timing drill that, that we do where the athletes are, let me make sure I get this off, where the athletes are focusing on their ability to create proper strike timing. So everything that we showed you just a second ago, same foot, same shoulder is happening. He's got his hips out over his knees with a solid punch to be, able to, to be able to get his timing down and understand and recognize what he's doing. Everybody's knowing, everybody knows what they're doing. All the, all the offensive guys are going in the same direction, and then the defensive players are able to come in and execute. It's a physical drill, uh, and it's meant to be that way because we want them to learn how to do this while being physical. Here's an example of, of University of Nebraska doing this drill in their indoor. And it was one of their first times to really go about doing it. But it's something that you can do. It's something you can do with your team, and you can get a lot of reps in and just help, help re-educate the, the technique. Then you can add drills like this where you add a finish element to it. Dang. Sorry about that, Coach. I'm going to Let me get this uh, off, there you go. So in this, in this finished component, 
You're watching the tacklers come in and execute, but now to be able to take them all the way to the ground. You don't always have to do this live. You can have this be in the drill where you have, you know, pads down or it might, they might be where they're holding a shield or whatever the case may be, but you're really able to do this and analyze their technique. In this case, you're seeing that the tackler doesn't get do a good job of getting his hips over his knees into contact. And he has to go through this, you know, to be able to understand how to be, how to, how to be better. This is another drill, a technical drill, where it's just focusing on the punch. And here you have the, the tackler, in the, and he has, he's, he's not facing the bag. And as the bag's getting drugged, he's, he's going to work on his footwork into contact, which is very difficult to do. But when he turns, we're looking for him to punt and to make it make be able to take the bag to the ground. It's a heavy bag. It's not a it's not a light bag, but it's 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 helping the athlete understand what he needs to do to be to, to do a good job in the contact. Hold on a second. So so let's just let's just take it a step further. And so what you're seeing is you're seeing a bunch of technical drills where we're isolating what the player has to do and we're and we're taking it all the way into contact. Instead of just starting in a drill where the player has his hand on the ground, you're actually working on the skills so he can develop them. And then when you get into to the decision making, you'll see where it starts to sharpen that skill. Here's an example of a D-line drill, and I'll, I'll play this a couple of times, where, where, the, where he's reacting to the, the down block and he's, and he's dealing that, with that zone read and having to make, it, make contact with the runner in the hole. But everything that we've been talking about is happening in right here. So as you can see, everything we showed you a second ago, getting that same foot, same shoulder in the ground, getting the hips over the knees and finishing is a part of this drill and helping him reinforce what he needs to do. And we're not doing it the same way every day. We're talking about changing the drill up, but still focusing on the same skill. When it comes to decision-making drills, we're talking about now changing the way you approach it. And this is probably one of the biggest things that I learned is that I kept going into every drill being the drill sergeant. And I needed to back off a little bit. I needed to be able to help let the player experience it. And I needed to put him in a drill where he could have some failure. What would happen is we'd do a technical drill. I'd go into the decision-making drill, and they wouldn't perform as well, and I'd get really upset. And what was happening is I hadn't created a progression that allowed them to understand how to execute and when to execute. And so by creating these these, these middle progressions, you're actually helping the player understand what he needs to do to be able to execute the technique that you're teaching him. Then how, how you approach that, you don't continue to coach the same way. Well, and now with, you're wanting player recognition of this and player awareness, so you ask him questions. And in the situation, you don't create a ton of options, you just create a couple. And then, and then you make sure that they're not winning every one of them. And if they are, you increase the difficulty of the drill. And so in a drill like this, you'd actually want to position yourself behind the defense where they can't see you, where the offense is the one that's going to get to see which way he's going to go. Now the, now the defense has to make the decision. And, and again, as the defense gets better at it, you want to create more difficulty, make it to where you can't see the runner. And he's going to have to make, he's going to have to make more decisions in a shorter amount of time. It's really your job as a coach to make sure that you're making that drill easier or harder or whatever it needs to be so your players will continue to improve and develop their, their confidence. And then probably one of the biggest mistakes coaches make is they forget about the offense. And it's really important that those offensive players know what their job is, know that it's a defensive-focused drill, but they need to compete. And, and that it's okay to give player-on-player -player feedback and then, then also understand how to protect themselves. When you do these drills, you can't – have it to where the players are just doing whatever. They have to understand how it is that they could get injured if they're not, they're not careful. This next drill is an example of a decision-making drill, and you're going to see where the players are reacting. What this is, it's just a, a leverage-based drill, and, and you're, you're showing that where the players are having to use visual cues to react. And so what's happening in this drill, we want the drill, we want these guys to, to be watching the, that near hit. And when it comes to, to tracking a player, the number one thing we talk about is, is mimicking the movement of the runner. And it starts right here. It starts right here in the hips. Okay, and so if his hips are turned, if his hips are turned lateral, my hips should be turned. So you see how this tackler right here is still squared up? 
and this, this guy's hips are running towards the sideline, this guy is ultimately going to get beat at some point because he's going to have to take a bunch of extra steps. Look at his feet. But look at this backside tackler. He's mimicking the movement of this, of this runner. And, and, and so what, as a coach, what you're looking for is, are they mimicking with their hips? Watch as this guy turns and watch that backside tackler. They look like, they look, look like synchronized swimmers. I mean, he's reacting because his eyes are right. But if you look at the tackler on the left, he is off balance. He's on his back foot. He's not able to react. And at some point, he's going to get beat. So as you see them turn, that, that tackle on the right is doing a good job. But watch as he turns back. And you don't need contact for this. This is pre-contact skill. Watch as he turns back. He's already headed back towards this the tackler. And there's no way he's going he's gonna to keep him from losing leverage. I mean, there's no way he's going to prevent this guy from beating him to the outside. So if this, was a, if this was a game situation, if this was a game situation, the tackler on the right would not even be able to be a part of this tackle at the very end. So again, you're using drills to help the players understand what they need to be looking at, and we call it eye control, so they can react and use the technique that you're showing them, whether it's a good base, whether it's good footwork, or whatever the case may be. Here's an example of Nebraska doing that same drill. And they implemented another, another aspect to it. Um, they, they had, it, had the, the, the runner finish by coming forward and the, and the defense coming together to make contact. One of the things that we did is we had the, the runner back up at five yards and go lateral and then move forward. Watch what happens as, as you do a drill. If you're, not, if you're not trying to do the drill right, you're going to teach bad habits. And so for me, as I'm looking at this drill, they're, they're not mimicking the hip of the runner. Okay, they're, they're, not, they're not putting themselves in a position to match his leverage. And so see how 55 is headed towards the sideline? Both these guys are still squared up. Their hips can turn, but their shoulders can stay squared. And watch as they come into contact, they don't have time to get their feet right. So as you look, for instance, right here, let me see if I can get it to stop. As they come into contact right here, Notice that the, the tackler, the, the, the tackler on the far end, he's not same foot, same shoulder into contact. He's got left shoulder hit with his left foot up. And then the, the guy on the left, he has his right shoulder hit, but his right foot's up. So both of them are, are having things that they can work on to be better. And we're, we're, this is a lateral drill, but you're incorporating the closing and space and that actions on that footwork that we're talking about. It's a great drill for defensive, all, all players actually but you can do this with or without pads, all that kind of stuff. Here's another example, here's another drill. This one right here is a, is a decision-making drill. And again, I'll stop it. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's incorporating closing space, but and coach, I know you guys have done this drill, but it's an incorporation of closing space and where the tackler is having to react to the runner. So you see these orange cones? As he comes through, that's when the runner starts. Normally programs will have it where the tackler's right here, and the runner starts, and they start at the same time. What we want to do is see the defender have to make a change in the way that he's reacting as the, as the runner takes off. So watch as he comes through, and the runner takes off. I know that's kind of choppy, but I'll show you a couple of different angles. And so now as a coach, as you're watching this, you're able to assess where is this player having, having trouble. And so as you look at this, you see that he's having to take a diagonal path into the tackle. We don't want that. We want him to be able to hit in a positive tackle situation. And so as you watch him do this, these drills, you'll realize that it's right here when the, when the runners take off, eyes of the tackle are not in the right spot. And I apologize for that. He's acting really late to me right now. <clears throat> okay, so as the tackler comes through right here, the runner's already starting to take in the tackle lane. So he's going to take two more steps before he's even in a position to change his direction. For us, that's where the problem is. We want the player to understand that it's his closing space time, but he's got to get his eyes right so he can react. And so all of these decision-making are really meant to help, help the coach understand what it is and help the understand what he needs to do beyond just the technique of making contact. Remind you, as a coach, in a drill like this, you want to be behind the defense so you can see what he's looking at. 
And that, that way you can relate to, to what he does as he experiences. Here's an example. Nebraska doing this same drill. You're going to see the same thing. You're going to see that tackler come through, change his feet, and react to make body on contact. It's a simple drill, but, it, but it's incorporating more than just one thing. And it's helping them understand how to use eye control. We have a ton of drills that we could show you, but I hope I hope this is coming across okay. Is it doing all right? Uh, kind of frozen right now, Coach. We didn't we didn't see that Nebraska drill. I I turned off my sound. Hold on one second. Say that again, Coach. We didn't see the Nebraska drill at all. Oh man, that's terrible. So can you cut cut and paste some of this? I mean cut cut. Cut some of the video or no? Should be able to. We'll see. Okay. So can you see the video now? Yeah. All right. So here's an. I'll just kind of start it where you might be able to cut it. But uh, here's an example of, of Nebraska doing that same drill. And, and I'm sorry that it's real choppy. But as he comes through, you're seeing the tackler react to the runner, and, he, and he's getting his feet right. And, it, and it's right it's right in this path right through as he comes through the cones that we're really assessing if his eyes are right because we want him to mimic mimic the movement of the runner okay and if, he, and if he's late it's going to be seen in his path to the tackle so in this one he's making contact in a positive tackle situation so his eye control was great and he was reacting fine now, as a coach you can change the width of this drill you can change the speed of this drill you can do a lot of things to continue to to progress the skill of your athlete. Does that would come out okay? Better than before. Okay, yeah, that sucks. Okay, and then in, in our game-based drills, this, this is really where, where we've taken a step uh, to where coaches are, are really starting to understand, you know, how can they improve their drill time? And that, that means putting them in a drill where they're actually playing a game and you as a coach, you quit coaching them on every step of the way. You just let them compete. We call these player-centered drills. And again, it's where you're, you're just letting them go. You're getting rep after rep, and you're celebrating the winner. And take a look at that execution rate. You want the offense to win. You want the defense to learn by losing. But you also want to make sure that the defense has a chance to, to be successful. And so you as a coach need to make sure that this is happening. And this is my biggest downfall. I wasn't doing that early on as a young coach. And, it, and you're not giving them the answers on how to get better. If anything, you're seeing if they can even come up with them. And if they're not, that's what you need to do a better job of in your technical and decision-making drills is making sure that you point that out. So when they get in a drill like this, they, they can tell you. In this, video, in this video clip, this is an example of a, of a clip of a, of a drill that we showed University of Washington and Ohio State back in 2015. And what happened is, is the tackler in black is going against the runner in gray, and each of them have four cones to go around. Their job is to get around a cone and come back into this grid before, before the offensive guy has a chance to score on the other side. When they turn the corner, there's really 16 different tackle situations that can happen. And we want the, the defender to continue to react to the runner all the way into contact. And we're able to, to assess his ability to, to, to find the runner, close, close on the runner, and do all the things that we're asking him to do. Here's a much better example in practice of one of our clients. Watch as these, as these tacklers, you're going to see multiple examples here, and hopefully it's coming across okay. But the players that are being the most successful are the ones that are closing space effectively and getting across that white line. They're able to anticipate contact and go same foot, same shoulder, into contact like they want to. Much like that, that, that clip we saw at the beginning of this. The guys that are waiting are the ones that are struggling on, on being able to maintain leverage and even make contact in some cases. Okay? So we want them to understand through, through game-based play what they need to do to be successful. I'm going to play this one more time. And instead of waiting for inside hole or, or team for the player to understand this, you're giving them reps where they can't anticipate What's going to go on? They're going to have to react, and they have to do it under pressure. And, and look at the coach over here to the right. He's not stopping anything. He's letting it go one rep after the next. I mean, he's encouraging them, but he's celebrating the winner and moving on. What I love about this is in all these clips, you're seeing all these players pay attention to what's going on. 
And the reason they are is because they don't know what's going to happen either. Like I said before, there's 16 tackle situations that came out in that drill. We even take it a step further. I think this is a great drill for special teams, and it's, and it's a two-on-two -two drill. We have two defenders. You have a blocker right here and a runner, uh, a runner who's going to go around cones, and no one knows what they're about to do. So when this drill gets started, they're all having to react to each other. The offense is having to react as well as the defense. And the same things apply. You got to maintain leverage on those ta on those blockers, just like you have to maintain leverage on the runners. Watch as this tackler that's closer to us takes a poor path all the way into contact. Okay, what I mean by that is when he gets here, look at that space. He should be squeezing tight to that window to make sure that that runner doesn't run off the butt of number seven. The offensive guy doesn't do that here, but a good running back would have, and it would have been a, it wouldn't have been a great situation. Here's some more examples here. And again, as they get better at closing space and, and, and maintaining leverage, they're able to shut that window down and work together and, and make tackles like they would in a game. It's important that you start creating game situations to where they're gonna start seeing that same thing show up. As we saw in that very first clip, that very first clip that, uh, of Coach Ash, he was talking about the importance, of, the importance of being able to have drills that show up on film. This uh, another one's a great one. It's, it's dealing with that alley player, the guy that's having to react to the quick pass. We'll start this drill with some kind of block destruction at the top or some kind of cut drill. And his whole job is to make contact in this box. So the emphasis is closing space and not worrying so much about contact. So you take contact out of it. You, you limit contact so you can allow the tackler to really work on the skill of closing space especially if you get a lot of screen teams and teams that like to get the ball out quick and you have a, a, a player that's in conflict that's going to have to react to both the run and pass. These are great drills. Watch as, watch as he comes off this – ah, sorry about that. Watch as he comes off this uh, – this, this, uh, as he comes off this block destruction and reacts and gets to the ball. And again, we're trying to just help him understand what he needs to do and continuously close space all the way into contact. It seems like a simple drill, but, but helping him do that and helping him understand how to do that is important. And you let the offense do whatever he needs to do to get out of that box. He can cut back, he can go in any direction. So the runner, the, the tackler doesn't know what's gonna happen. And as a coach, you can continue to make this harder. You can move these cones back and, and make it to where if you're successful at this cone, now back up and be successful from a further distance and just see how well they can do and find out where they're at. Here's an example of one of our class doing this in practice. Watch as the first tackler, he doesn't sacrifice, he sacrifices the fact that the guy cuts back on him, but closing space is really important. And because he's able to anticipate contact, he's able to still go same foot, same shoulder into contact. And, he, and, he, and he, even though he hits with his left shoulder and the guy cuts back on him, he's still able to get his left foot in the ground and look what happens. Because he's able to do that, the runner goes backwards. In this next example, you're going to see the tackler not do that. He's going to shut down space. And because he, he, lets, the tap, he lets the runner out, he, he's, it's hard for him to maintain leverage, and the runner gets an extra few yards after contact. It's drills like this, and I'll play them again. It's drills like this that allow the player to get the reps that he's going to get in team and the reps that he's going to get in seven on seven and inside hole without it having to have everything else to be a part of it. You're really breaking the game down so they can continue to get better at what, what they're going to experience. Okay. And you don't want to live in these drills either. You want it to be how you as a coach will assess your players. Here's another one. We, we call it the, the tackle assessment game. And, and, and the way this works is that the runner has to go around two cones to score on the other side. The defender has to go around either one of these cones before he can close space. So it's going to force leverage to get established, much like you would at nearly any position. So you're looking at about eight different tackle situations. And as this runner goes backwards, he's going backwards to really limit the amount of contact these two players are going to have. And now we, we're going to evaluate the tackler's ability to mimic the movement of the runner. So in this case, you see that he doesn't float to the middle here. Where the tap where the runner is, and, and now he doesn't give up all this space back to the inside. 
and just like you saw in that first that first clip of that positive tackle situation, he's able to keep the runner on his right on his left shoulder here, and because of that, he has to he gets to force him to his left, and then he gets to initiate contact. And so you're you're improving the player's ability to understand how leverage works and how it, how it helps him be better at maintaining it. And, it, and it's just one rep after the next. I mean, we're not slowing down for anything. If anything, we're just going to celebrate the winner. Okay? Here's an example of, 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 uh, of one of our clients doing this in practice. Watch as the defender continues to close space all the way into contact. And everything we're doing, we're just building every time. We're just building on it. So that's why we call these player-based uh, player drills. This last one that we're going to show you is a is a inside out leverage drill. And what this does is it establishes leverage. And a lot of these drills we've shown you so far, the defenders having to to uh, create leverage on the run. But by widening these out and creating different angles for the offensive player, the defense is going to be either outside in or inside out. And so now, if you're a really a, a I mean, I think all teams are leverage based teams. But you're really emphasizing this and putting more context to it. So the tackler, I mean, the runner can go around any one of these four cones, and the defender is going to, to set leverage. And then he's going to have to react to the runner based on that. So in this case, the runner goes wide, and it becomes a perimeter tackle into the sideline, much like you saw in that, that, that first clip. But, but watch as, as he continues to close space. You're seeing he doesn't hesitate. He keeps coming. So you're seeing a great example of effectively closing space and using proper footwork into contact. And then we apply the same kind of, the same kind of uh, drills to this. Here, here's an example in practice of, of, again, a team doing this. And it's just, watch as everybody's doing this. Everybody's paying attention. They're all engaged because they don't know what's going to happen. I mean, even the defensive linemen did it. Linebackers are here doing it. And, and you're, not, you're not worried about the fact that the lineman's going to deal with that situation in the game or not. You're just still, you're still working on the skill. You're still working on the skills of, of tracking under pressure and, and having leverage and, and having to deal with, with the situation that you've been given. Okay. Uh, in this next one, uh, now we just applied those same kind of uh, same kind of concepts we talked about before. Um, obviously, you can change the depth of this, but you have one one uh, one tackler going around the cone, and he's got to maintain leverage outside in, inside out. The other guy needs to focus on closing space based on what happens in front of him. We call these second fitter drills. And again, we've added a blocker. You can do it where it's two verse one, two verse two. It really doesn't matter. But as they come out, the blocker is going to pick up first threat and then everything else reacts. And it's much more uh, uh, game based. Uh, it looks a lot more like game situation. Watch as that second tackler comes all the way in. I mean, he's accelerating because he understands what he needs to do. He doesn't have any time. He's got to, the important thing for him is to keep closing. While the first tackler is trying to maintain leverage and establish, establish leverage on the blocker, the second guy is, is now making him right by closing space. And that's linebackers, that's safeties, that's your overhang players, that's everybody. And so we're helping giving them a situation that they'll get way before they get into team. Uh, Coach, I, I know we went through that kind of fast and it was fairly choppy, so I apologize. But, but really the message here is about drill variation. It's about making sure that you're taking the skill and you're, and you're, doing, you're, you're actually using different drills to develop it. You know, and there's a lot of coaches that go, you know what, we do these drills and we've always done these drills. And I get it. I used to be one of those coaches. But I love this quote. Some coaches love winning so bad they're willing to change. Some hate change so bad they're willing to lose. And, and the game is changing on us. I mean, what the kids are experiencing is, is making it harder for them to make decisions. And so, you know, when you're, when you're looking at practice time in season, you're probably looking at maybe some, – some teams only tackle once a week. Some, te some teams tackle three times a week, but it's usually about 10 minutes a day. That's about it. And so what we're saying is that you can get in a drill like that close angle tackle and do two reps as, as a technical drill where – they go to their left twice, they go to their right twice, and then that's it. And then you take that same drill, you don't change a cone, and now you turn it into a decision-making drill. Now it's time to compete. Now you tell the offense to beat him left or right. 
Now the experience of that tackler has changed dramatically. He's not just going through the motions anymore. And now you're in your third minute or in your fifth minute of, of the drill or whatever. It's a five-minute drill. You can do this. And then on your last reps, you let the runner do whatever he needs to do to score between the cones. And so as a coach, you haven't changed one cone. You just changed the focus. And so by changing the focus without changing the drill, you're truly giving that player an A to Z experience of focusing on technique, understanding visual cues, and then executing in a game-based situation where they have to compete. And that's what this is all about. And, and so we've created these resources for coaches, obviously, where we have technical drills, we have decision-making drills, and we have game-based drills that approach things like strike timing which is the most difficult thing to do when it comes to tackling. I don't know, how, how are we doing on time? We're good, Coach. Okay, and so this, this last piece is really about having a plan. And, uh, you know, instead of just going out and having that, that plan where you're doing the same thing every day, you're actually addressing it based on either based on a plan leading up to your first game where you increase the, the difficulty and the dynamics of your drills to where your players are slowly adding to the skill set, or in season, you're applying data from the previous game. Instead of just working on tackling, you're actually working on what didn't go well in the last game. And so at Atavis, we've created a year-round focus. We have, we have drill progressions for the off-season. We have drill progressions in early August all the way up to your first game. And then we have an in-season approach. And just, just taking a look at this, just thinking about the way you do it, you can, you can do this as a coach. You can, you can create these progressions that help improve your tackling and help make tackling important for your program. And when you're looking at tackling itself, how you measure it, it's so important. You know, uh, when we met with Bobby Wagner from the Seahawks, his, one of the things he talked about was really hard on him to know that he made a tackle that was effective for the situation in the game, but the coach told him it was a bad tackle. And what we want to focus on is, is, is reward performance, but give them something to improve their skill. So tell them that, that, that it was a good outcome, but give them something on how to be even better. And so we've done that by measuring what's important. We use comparative data, we use team and positional trends, and, and we use that to, to try to create a, a positive culture for tackling for higher expectations. This is an example of some data that we collected when we were working with Michigan State. Now, obviously, we want to lessen head contact. And for Michigan State in that first year, before us, they had 142 tackles where they made head contact first when they made a tackle. The first year with us, we saw a drop in that. Now, that's something I want to say is they were on defense. They had more defensive plays that second year in 2017 than they did in 2016, yet they had a drop in head contact. But we also wanted to see shoulder contact because we tracked that. We saw an increase of 20, it went from 28.6% of the time they made, they made contact with their shoulder to 53%. And that's why they became, they went from 80th in the country into the top 20. When it comes to working with programs, we also uh, track uh, explosive misses. And what I mean by that is the tackler made contact with the runner and still gave up 10 yards after contact. We call those the explosive misses. And so in this case, you're seeing that the team had, they had 40 instances for 864 yards the year before we started working with them. And that next year, they had 17 for 259. So we're just, tack, we're just talking about the point of contact. We're just talking about tackling. And so we also track non-contact misses where they actually do a whiff. We saw a reduction in that. So, so you're looking at nearly 1,000 yards gone just because you got better at tackling in those one-on-one -on -one situations. We were able to show uh, player uh, performance. This player was drafted in the sixth round last year, but his sophomore year, he, he made 74% of his tackles. His junior year, after going through that, was at 84%. And you're seeing an in the amount of tackles that he made with his shoulder, he went to 72%. And then you're seeing how many yards he gave up back. Cut in half. He had a senior year with fortunate enough to get drafted into the, into the NFL. So we do that by providing a report now. We have team-based reports, and I'm not going to into these. I'm just showing we have team-based reports. We have position-based reports. We have reports that are helping explain and identify what it is that, that the team is doing well. We also 
worker programs by, by giving uh, us back in hub. Um, what we'll do is we'll get their huddle home and, and we'll provide uh, player position, types of tackles, how they, what their issues were, for comments, and we give those back on Monday. So we get the film on a Saturday and we get those back on Monday so programs can see. And then what we do and what you could do as a, as a coach, if you're, if you're just identifying this in your program, even if you just identify the, the most important uh, tackles in the game where it, it created a, a, you know, a, a big play or whatever the case may be, if you just did that alone, you would have a much better insight on what it is that your team needs to focus on. And then what you want to do is apply that to your practices. Here's an example of what we do for programs where we would actually come in and in this case, this team, uh, practice, they, they tackled three times a week, and they had about 10 minutes. And so we'd give them about three drills, and we'd show them a progression, and they could actually work through those progressions in, in 10 minutes, stay in a drill for five minutes, work through two drills in five minutes, however they wanted to do it. And, and it's important as a staff that you're aligned with the type of language that you're going to use with your players. You can't have one coach saying one thing and one coach saying another. And, and if you're like the programs I've worked with, you have coaches on a whole other field going over tackling, and you don't even know what they're saying. As a program, if you can give them some resources or making sure that they're, that they're going to be saying the right things, that you know that all the, the players and coaches will be aligned. And because of that, you're going to hear the, the kids talking about it, and the kids will be using that language. So, you know, whether it's videotaping your drills or writing down, writing down how your drills are going to work so all your coaches understand it. It's, it's important that you use those, those resources to align your staff. And you don't need Atavis to do that. This is something you can do on a normal basis. And if you're, not, if you're not videotaping your drills and you're not making it where you can hear what's being said, that alone will really enlighten you on how to get better as a staff. And that, obviously, that's what we do. And we, we work with programs in over 30 states and I think six countries now, and, and we're very proud of that. But uh, um, obviously, uh, it's something you can do without having to use a program like Adams. Coach, I have this one last clip. I don't, I don't know if it'll if it, if it's choppy. I probably won't play it. It's still pretty choppy. Yeah. Okay. I I won't even play it. I'll I'll, I'll skip it. But. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, our promise is really to help coaches. And if and if you if you find ways to maximize your drill time, you're gonna you're gonna give yourself a competitive edge. But do it with a plan. Don't just go and just do it. We've had programs that just go out and do drills, and they don't even it doesn't build. We do that with nearly every other thing we do on the football field when we do our install, and you can do it with your tackling. And what you're gonna see is your players are gonna are going to react more instinctively. They're going to be more effective in contact and they're going to be safer in contact. I hope, I hope what I provided is, is helpful. I know the video wasn't that great and that, that doesn't help, but um, if, you just, if you just take a look at how you're drilling, you're tackling, and you, and you create a plan and you, and you create a universal language, you're going to see, you're going to make tackling important because of that, you're going to see it get better. Coach, you want to go ahead and unshare your screen? Yep, I can do that. Awesome. Uh, we'll just do a quick, you know, follow up if you don't mind. Yeah, no question. Hey, and again, I apologize about the about the video. I'm out. I'm out, and uh, I'm out away from the city a little bit, and so it kind of kind of gets choppy. It's all good, Coach. Uh, that last thing you kind of hit on. Is something that I don't think a lot of coaches really think about. You know, we have our offensive systems and we have our defensive systems. You even have a special team system, and you in, you're not going to install your whole system at once on offense or defense. You're going to have an install schedule where, okay, let's let's install the base, and then we'll we'll talk about the tags off of our base, and then, you know, you you progress right. Well, we got to think of tackling as an install system. You know, when I was taught how to tackle, it was you know, basically all done in one day. So. I like the way you all do it. It's installing your tackling system, baby steps first, right? Yep. Yeah, and, and you know, I'd even argue, I mean, there's blocking systems. Yeah. You know, whether you're wing T or zone or power based or gap scheme based team, and you're, you're, you're slowly installing that, you're slowly installing the steps, you're slowly telling those linemen and, and, and fullbacks and H backs where to get their eyes when they attack a, a block or attack when they attack a tackler. 
Uh, we're doing the same thing. We're, 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 applying, we're applying those concepts to tackling and, and just having patience with it. What's happened because, because the way the game has gone, we're, we're playing a different game today, but we're still using the tackling that we did 20 years ago. And it's important that you take a look at that, and you're going to find that you can improve your program without – and it's, it's already at your school. You don't have to go out and, and do a bunch of new things. It's just about having a better plan. And if, uh, if, you, need, if you need a program to be able to, to, to align your staff and even your feeder schools, that's what Atavis can do. And, and, and Coach, uh, you know, I can help uh, uh, give any kind of resources to any program that might be interested. So just give them my information. And if you want to find me, I'm on Twitter. It's uh, Coach Rex Norris on Twitter. And so you, you can reach out there. Sounds great, Coach. Uh, Coach Rex Norris, head of Atavis Football. Uh, great stuff, Coach. We appreciate it. Thanks, Coach. I appreciate you for having me. Not a problem. Hey, coaches, hope you enjoyed that video from Rex Norris, head of football at Atavis Tackling. Uh, for more great content, check out our online clinic at clinic.chiefpigskin.com. And be sure to hit the buttons below to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks, coaches.